all of you here probably know Don Blackwell, or you probably wouldn't have come all the way that you have, so I won't take up any more of his time. Don asked for a cue. Don, this is it, brother. Preach us the word. Good evening. It is good to see everyone here tonight. I'm very delighted to be here with you. And I know some of you came from a distance, and I appreciate that very much. I see some old friends here, uh, some that I have known for a long time, Brother Keith, who led the prayer. We have been best of friends for about the last 15 years or so, and I love and appreciate him. And uh, I am so thankful uh, for you being here tonight, not just to hear the gospel preached, but of course uh, to express uh, your love and appreciation toward our family, and that means a great deal. Before I get started tonight, I want to mention that, let's see, the table's out this direction, right, Ron? There is a table, if you will go out this door, there is a table that we have set up for the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and it has DVDs on that table. In fact, the lesson that I'm going to do tonight is on a DVD. If you want a copy of it, you can pick those up. They are free of charge. There is a sign-up sheet if you would like to receive uh, emails from the Gospel Broadcasting Network about new programs that we're doing. If you want our daily email, we send out a daily devotional every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you can get that and then uh, have that with your morning coffee. Uh, there are uh, a number of different things, our newsletter that you can sign up. If you'd like to make a contribution to GBN, there's a form for that. We never sell anything at GBN. We exist completely on the so, uh, free will offerings of members of the church and congregations of the Lord's people. And so if you'd like to support our work, uh, that's the only way we survive is by contribution, so please keep that in mind. A number of you have asked tonight to how I am doing, and I will just say a brief word. Uh, this is my second meeting since I got out of the hospital and trying to get life back together, and uh, it has been difficult. Uh, to be honest, it's been difficult. We are having to relearn everything from how to get dressed in the morning to how to get around in a wheelchair to how to uh, redefine who you are I'm still facing another surgery uh, very soon. I've got to go in and get my neck worked on. I still have a cracked neck, and I went in just recently. I was telling some folks tonight to get an MRI done, and if you've ever been inside of one of those and you're claustrophobic like I am, I made the mistake of opening my eyes while I was in there, and then I screamed, get me out of here. <laughs> and so they took me out, and they're going to put me back in soon. Uh, and I said, you're going to have to sedate me. I am not getting back in that thing. And so they're going to put me to sleep, which I said is fair. I've been putting people to sleep for years, and so <laughs> we, can, um, we can do that. Uh, but please keep us in your prayers as I'm facing another surgery and um, getting back to uh, preaching and uh, trying to, as long as we're living, we've got work to do for the Lord's kingdom, and uh, that's what we're trying to press on and, and keep doing. Just a little over a year ago, we were having the lectureship at the South Haven Congregation. And uh, let's see, is this turned on and ready to go? Okay. Just about a year ago, we were having the lectureship at the South Haven Congregation. And the very last night of our lectureship, uh, Brother Robert Taylor spoke, as he has for many years. And just as he finished speaking that night, I got a call from Sherry. And uh, she said, you need to get over to the uh, retirement home. She said, my dad is not doing well. And so I jumped in my truck and I took off over there. And when I got there, Sherry and her sister and the hospice nurse were sitting with Sherry's dad. And her dad was breathing very erratically, just... <gasps> <gasps> and she said it had been that way for hours. When I got there, the nurse said, you need to tell him it's okay to let go. She said, sometimes... People just fight, dying, they don't want to let go. And I walked over to him, and I put my hand on his chest, and I said, Frank, I'm here with the girls. I said, I'm here with Sherry. Brandy's husband's on the way. I said, you can let go. Go be with the Lord. Go be with Jane. And almost instantly, he let out a breath, and he settled down, and he passed. What happened at that moment? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. I believe at that moment that my father-in-law passed from this life as a faithful gospel preacher, and I believe he saw angels and went to be with the Lord. What happens when we die? 
we're going to talk tonight about that question. It is something that everybody who's lived any length of time wonders about. Now, the world, of course, has given us all kinds of explanations as to what happens when we die. You know, some people believe in reincarnation. They believe that you die and you come back as another being, and they will say that if you lived a good life that you will come back maybe as, um, you know, a human being. If you lived a really good life, you might come back as a rich, good-looking human being. And, you know, if you lived a bad life, you might come back as an animal. And, you know, some people have the idea, don't swat that fly, it might be Uncle Ricky, you know, that sort of thing. And, of course, the Bible doesn't teach that. Some people have the idea of ghost. That is, your soul or your spirit will haunt a particular area after you die. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Roman Catholic Church has given us the concept of purgatory. That is, you die, and if you're not good enough to go to reward, then you'll go to a place of suffering, and you'll stay there for just a little while. And then once you get done with that, then you can move on to the place of reward. Punishment and then reward. The Bible doesn't teach that. And, of course, very popular in the world today is the idea that when you die, you simply cease to exist. The Bible doesn't teach that. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to trace the journey of the soul. And I put a chart together, which is, is not up here. Let's see here. All right, he's working on the chart here, so I'll stall for a minute while we're getting our, our chart started. We're going to trace the journey of the soul tonight, and we're going to answer the question, where do we go when we die? Years ago, when I first prepared this sermon, I entitled the, this sermon, The Journey of the Soul from Birth to Eternity. From birth, uh, originally, it was from birth to eternity, but when I thought about that, I thought, that's not right, is it? Because the journey of the human soul doesn't begin at birth, does it? The journey of the human soul begins at the point of conception, right? And so I went back and I altered this. Okay, we've got the chart up and going. I want you to notice this because we're going to use this as we trace the journey of the soul tonight. Now, I want you to watch this when I click this next slide. You see how I went back and I added this? I have the soul coming from heaven. The reason I went back and added that, it seems like a simple thing, but it's very important. Because the Bible tells us the soul begins at the point of conception and the soul begins in heaven. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 is a passage that oftentimes we use at funerals and we talk about someone's death. But it tells us something very important about the beginning of life. Listen to the end of this verse. It says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it were, now listen to this part, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now that tells me something important about the Spirit. That's the reason for this, because the Spirit came from God who gave it. A clear, a Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9 calls God the Father of Spirits. And so what that means is at the point of conception, when the egg meets the sperm and that new little baby life is created, what happens is God places a soul in that teeny tiny human being. Now mama and daddy may give that child his physical characteristics, but they don't give him his soul. God gives him his soul. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. God said, let us, that is the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What does it mean that we're made in the image of God? You ever think about that? Brethren, that means I have a soul. It means there's a part of me that will never cease to exist. Animals don't have that. We are far superior to the animals in that sense. And so from the time that God places that soul in that little bitty baby body, that soul is going to dwell in my body for the rest of my existence, the rest of my physical existence anyway. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... Now let me stop right there. That's interesting. He says our earthly house, this tent, he describes this physical body as a tent. Isn't that interesting? Why does he call it a tent? You know, if you go out for the weekend and you're going to go camping, you don't take brick and mortar with you, do you? Why not? Because that's too permanent. You're going to take a tent because it's temporary. Keep that in mind. He says, we know that our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, but we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Keep that concept of the tent in your mind. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 describes this physical body as mortal. It describes it as corruptible. For 70 years, for 80 years, however long I live, that soul is going to dwell in this tent. 
Now, during that time, I am going to worship God, but I'm going to do it with my soul. Tonight, when we worshiped, when we sung praises, when we prayed, we engaged the physical body. We moved our lips. We moved our vocal cords. But we worshiped Him with our soul, right? Isn't what the Bible teaches? John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. I worship God with my spirit, or I don't. I make a choice. During that time, the 70 years or 80 years that my soul is in this body, I'm going to love God with my soul, or I don't. Isn't that what Luke said? Um, in uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength in your mind. So I love God with my soul, or I don't. I make a choice. I want you to listen how... Solomon describes the wearing out of this physical body. For 70 years, 80 years, my soul's been dwelling in this body. It's a tent. Listen to what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. That is, remember God when you're young. When you get old, life begins to get difficult, he says. It's harder in many ways. He says, before the years draw nigh that you say, I have no pleasure in them. You start getting aged. Some things that gave you pleasure as a young person begin to change. He says, you get to the point that the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. What does that mean? As this body gets aged, you begin to lose your eyesight. He said, the cloud does not return after the rain in the days when the keepers of the house begin to tremble. What's he talking about when he says the keepers of the house tremble? He's talking about your hands. You get to the, to, to the point that your hands begin to shake. He says, the strong men bow themselves because they are weak. He's talking about the legs. Your body begins to get old. Your legs give out. He says, the grinders cease because they are few. What do you think that's a reference to? talking about the teeth. You begin to lose your teeth. He says, those that look through the windows grow dim. He says, the doors are shut in the street. The sound of grinding is low when one rises up at the sound of a bird. That is, you don't sleep like you used to when you were a young person. He says, the daughters of music are brought low. You can't hear. Begin to lose your hearing as you get older. He says, they are afraid of heights. There is terror in the way. Why would you be afraid of heights? Well, if the legs begin to shake, you don't want to be in a high place. And then he lis listens to, to this part. He says, when the almond tree blossoms, what is that a reference to? If you ever see an almond tree, when it's uh, blooming, it's got this beautiful gray, this beautiful white blossom up top. It's like the hair of your head. You know, the leaves look like, the, in fact, I see some almond trees blossoming tonight. But what he's saying is, as the leaves turn white, now some of us, the leaves just fall out, but it's the same thing. But he says, your hair begins to turn gray. He says, the grasshopper is a burden. This thing that used to be very small is now difficult. Now listen to this part. Man goes to his eternal home. The mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed, before the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, the wheel is broken at the well. He is very eloquently saying, you die. Now here we go. Listen to this. He says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it were, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. What he says is, for 70 years, 80 years, my spirit dwells in this body. All the while, it's just a tent. It's wearing out. It's going to get to the point my hands begin to shake. I can't see. My hearing fails. Eventually, the body's going to die, and then the spirit returns. What happens to me when I die? For 75 years, my spirit's been dwelling in this body. Psalm 90 and verse 10 says, The days of our years are 70 years. If by reason of strength, they are 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, I like the, this next part, he says, and we fly away. You ever think about the words there? I'm going to die, and then I fly away. I've oftentimes said at a funeral, when you've got that uh, body in the casket in front of you, I will say, brother so-and-so is not here with us today because he's flown away. That's what the, the, the body's just the tent. I am the soul. Genesis 35 and verse 18, when Rachel died, giving birth to her son Benjamin, the Bible uses some very interesting language. It says, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing. You know what that means? That's the Bible definition of death. 
is when the soul is in departing. That's why James 2.26 says, The body without the spirit is dead. That is the biblical definition of death is when the soul leaves the body. Now, the question is, where does it go? That's what I want to know. Where do we go when we die? Somebody says, well, Donna, the resurrection day, I'm going to get a new body. My soul is going to get a new incorruptible body. I know that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what about in the meantime? Listen to this description. 1 Corinthians 15, for, for, or 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Right now I'm in a tent. One day I'm going to get the resurrected body. He calls that a building. It's not temporary. But then listen to verse 4. He says, For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but that we may be further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. Now that's some very interesting language there. He says, right now I'm in a tent. One day I'm going to have a building that is a permanent uh, housing for my soul. But then he refers to us being unclothed. When is that going to happen? Brethren, right now my body is in a tent. One day it's going to get a building. But what if I die before the day of resurrection? My soul is not going to have a body. It will be unclothed, if you will. That's the language that the Bible uses. It's going to be unclothed. When I die and my spirit doesn't have a body, where is it going to go? Now, that's going to take us to the next part of this chart. I made a little bridge that you see here. It's death. It's because Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Sometimes I hear people talking about, you know, I died and I came back and I went to heaven and I wrote a book about it. You ever hear people say that sort of thing? You know what? I don't believe that. Because the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. Since the days of miracles have ended, men don't die and go to heaven and come back. If they say that today, they are lying. Now, the question is, what happens after I die? I want you to notice on the chart... In the first section, we've got the earth. This is where we all currently are. You'll notice there are two arrows, the saved and the lost. Each of us is traveling one of those paths. You'll notice that death has two bridges. One is for the saved, one is for the lost, one is narrow, one is wide. That is because Matthew 7 and verse 13 says, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that go in thereat. You'll notice the other is wide. It's because Matthew 7, 14 says that wide is the gate, broad is the way, and many, in fact, most, most of the world is going to enter in thereat. Now, where does my spirit go after the bridge that we call death? That's going to take us to the next part of this chart. This is the Hadean realm. This is Hades. Now, friends, people oftentimes get confused about this because when they hear Hades, they think of the place of punishment. That is incorrect. The word Hades actually refers to the dwelling place of the dead. Hades is kind of a, a holding area for disembodied spirits. Good people who die go to Hades. Bad people who die go to Hades. I think part of the reason people get confused about this is because the King James Version has translated the word for Hades and the word for hell, both of them, as the word hell. It's incorrect. You, it, it's caused confusion. In the original language, you've got two different places. You've got the dwelling place of the dead, which is Hades, Hades. And then you've got the eternal dwelling place of the wicked and the devil, which is hell. It is Gehenna. Two different places, two different words. The King James translators translated both of these words as hell. It has caused great confusion. Let me give you an example of this. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. King James Version. The word in the original is not hell, it is Hades. Jesus actually said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of death. The dwelling place of the dead shall not prevail against it. You know what that means? What that means is, for three years, Jesus had been telling his disciples, I'm going to establish my kingdom. I'm going to establish my kingdom. Prepare for the kingdom. Then he's about to die. What are they going to think if he dies? He tells them in Matthew 16, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates 
of death. That is, death itself is not going to prevent my kingdom. That's what Matthew 16 and verse 18 means. If you don't know the difference in these two words, you're going to get confused. Now, incidentally, in the New Testament, the dwelling place of the dead is called Hades. In the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, the word is Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. Sheol and Hades, two different places, or it's the same place, two different words. One is Hebrew, the other is Greek. Once you understand that all people go to Hades when they die, it's going to clear up some things for you. For example, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, in the King James Version, it refers to Jesus after His death as being in hell. Friends, Jesus did not go to hell when He died. He went to Hades. In the original language, the word is Hades here, not hell. That makes sense when you understand that in Luke 21, 43, Jesus told the thief on the cross, you remember, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When you understand that paradise is in Hades, then Acts 2, 31 and Luke 23, 43 fit together. Now, the best description that I know of Hades in all of the Bible is in Luke chapter 16, I want to read it together. Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. It describes for us both compartments of Hades. The Bible says this, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now listen to what it says about him. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, this is the word Hades, not hell. And in Hades, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. He went to Hades. The Bible says specifically the portion of Hades that is torment. And he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And then he says, and besides this, now remember this because this is going to be key to a doctrine I mentioned just a minute ago. Beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix so that they who would pass to you cannot, neither can they pass to us who would come from thence. Now let's break this down and talk about it. First, if you look at the top of the chart, the blue part labeled as paradise, this is where Lazarus was taken. We are told Lazarus died and he's carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. This is the part of Hades where the righteous go to await judgment. This is the part called paradise. This is the place Jesus promised the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. You know, I have oftentimes heard it said, when they ask people, what is the greatest fear that you have in life? There are two things that are oftentimes at the top of the list. Number one is death. Number two is public speaking. <laughs> now that's interesting. The greatest fear that mankind has is death. Could that be the reason that when we die, immediately we have angels waiting to take us by the hand and say, don't fear. We have an escort to take us into the realm of the dead, so we won't have to be afraid. I believe when a righteous person dies, immediately he lifts up his eyes to see angels escorting him. I believe a year ago when my father-in-law passed, just beyond our ability to see, angels escorted him to paradise. The etymology for the word paradise, if you go back and study the origin of this word, it carries with it the idea of a pleasure garden. If you look at the bottom of Hades, the, the bottom part of the chart here, it is torment. This is where the rich man went. This is the section of Hades, the original language calls Tartarus. This word appears in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 where it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This place is described thus. In verse 22 it says, The rich man also died and was buried. There are no angels waiting to escort him. 
He died and he's buried. Verse 23 says, And he lift up his eyes in Hades, specifically being in torment. When I preach on this sometimes, in fact, I've got a whole sermon just on this section of this particular illustration. I like to preach about the misery and suffering in this place. We could spend the whole night talking about that. But very briefly, would you appreciate with me that when a person dies and goes to this place, he is burning in fire? When a person dies and goes to this place, he's crying and he's begging for mercy. He believes that one mere drop of water on the tip of his tongue would bring him some relief. And I want you to appreciate with me that every person who has died lost from the beginning of time until seconds ago, they're in this place. And they are crying and they're suffering. Some have been there for thousands of years. Now another observation I want you to notice between paradise and torment on the chart, do you notice that there is a a line fixed, a green line? I want you to hold that in your mind because I'm going to tell you something very important about that green line. The Bible calls it a great gulf there. Did you notice also that as we read Luke chapter 16 that the rich man and Lazarus, they're conscious? Brethren, when we die and we go into the realm called Hades, there is consciousness there. There is a doctrine that is taught by some in the religious world, particularly the Jehovah's Witnesses teach this. It is called soul sleeping. They say that when you die and you go into Hades, that you just cease to know anything. You're just asleep until the day of resurrection. I want you to notice that Lazarus is comforted. I want you to notice that the rich man is crying in pain. They are very much conscious. You know, Psalm 116 and verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. I don't think the Bible saying it's precious to God when we become unconscious. I preached one time a sermon kind of similar to this in Tennessee, and a brother came up to me afterwards as we were shaking hands and walking out the door. He said, Brother Don, that was a great sermon. He said, but you were wrong about one part of it. And I said, what's that? And he said, you're wrong about there being consciousness in in Hades. And he handed me a piece of paper folded up and he walked off. Well, man, I couldn't wait to open that piece of paper. I unfolded it and it had written on it Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5 where the Bible says, the dead know not anything. He took that to mean that when we die, we're just asleep. Incidentally, that's the same way the Jehovah's Witnesses use that verse. But he was pulling it out of context. Because Ecclesiastes 9.5 is surrounded by some other verses. If you look at Ecclesiastes 9.6, the next verse, you'll see the phrase, under the sun. If you look at Ecclesiastes 9.3, under the sun. 9.9, under the sun. 9.13, under the sun. All throughout that chapter, the context is things under the sun. You know what that means? Go back a step on the chart and you look at this earth. That's the realm that's under the sun. What he's telling us is when you die and you go into the Hadean realm, the dead know not anything under the sun. That is, you don't know what's going on back on this earth. That's what Ecclesiastes 9 is saying. You know, there is a doctrine that is taught by some. They hold the idea that when a person dies, that he is watching over us. There was a song years ago, Steve Warner did it. It was called, a country music song. It was called, There are Holes in the Floor of Heaven. And the song is about a man, his wife has died, and he raises his little girl and, and without her mother. And the day comes that she gets married, and it's raining, and he says it's tears from heaven, and, you know, uh, mama's watching over us. And it's a common idea, but the Bible doesn't teach it. The, the Bible teaches the dead know not anything under the sun. You know that makes sense. Could you imagine being in paradise, watching all the terrible things happening on this earth? I don't know how it could be paradise. Watch. Now, somebody says, Don, I don't think you're right about this part. You know, I can prove this. If you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, God told King Josiah that he was going to destroy Jerusalem. But he said, said, you're going to die before it happens. So listen to the words of this. 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 28, he says, Surely I will gather you unto your fathers in peace. You shall be gathered to your grave. What's that mean? You're going to die. He says, therefore, your eyes shall not see the calamity that I will bring upon this place. What's that mean? You're going to be dead, so you're not going to see what goes on back on this earth. What's the point of that? The dead know not anything under the sun. Now, remember I told you to notice the green line? 
This is what I want you to get out of this. The Bible says between paradise and torment, there is a great gulf fixed. Luke 16 and verse 26 says there is a divide, there is a chasm so that you can't pass from one side to the other. If you die and go to paradise, you are there to stay until the day of judgment. If you die and go to torment, you are there to stay until the day of judgment. What that means is the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory is incorrect. You don't go to one place and transfer to the other, which means people in torment that have been there for thousands of years and they're crying and suffering, it never ends. And it's not going to end. Here's the next part of our chart. This is the resurrection day. Now, we don't usually call it the resurrection day. We usually call it the judgment day, don't we? The Bible usually calls it the day of the Lord. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. What's going to happen on that day to the souls that are in paradise? All the dead people who are in the realm of the dead, what's going to happen to them when the Lord comes again? Well, what's going to happen is this earth is going to give up its bodies. Hades is going to be emptied of souls and they're going to be reunited. Now hold on because I know what you're thinking. Listen to what the Bible says. John says, John 5, 28, he says, For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, that is the Greek word for tombs, all that are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And so the souls are going to come from Hades, the bodies are going to come from this earth, and they're going to be reunited. But listen to what I'm going to say. It's not going to be the same body. It's going to be a different body. It's going to be the resurrected. This body is the tent. The resurrected body is going to be the building, a house not made with, God, uh, with hands eternal in the heavens. Sometimes I've had people ask me, they say, Don, is it a sin to be cremated? I remember a sister asking me that one time, and I said, no, it's not a sin to be cremated. Why would you say that? And she said, it just seems like it's going to be a problem on the day of judgment if I've been cremated. You know, the resurrection, if I've been cremated, how's that going to work? Brother, it's not going to be a problem. God made us from the dust of the ground. It is not going to be a problem. And the resurrected body is not going to be the same particles, if you, if you will, for, for lack of a better word. It's not going to be the same material, if you will. How do I know that? I know that because 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50 says, Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The resurrected body is not going to be a flesh and blood body. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 says, The body, that is the physical body, is sown in dishonor, is raised in glory. Listen to what he says. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Listen to what he says. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Now let's break that down. Number one, he says the resurrected body will be incorruptible. This body gets old. Our eyesight fails, our hands shake, our legs give out. This body's corruptible. The resurrected body will be incorruptible. This body, he says, has a lot of problems. This body, he says, is sown in dishonor. But this one's going to be, the resurrected will be raised in glory. What does that mean? Brethren, if we would be honest... Our present bodies have many things associated with them that are lowly and that are vile. He said the resurrected body is not going to be like that. This body, he says, is going to be is a physical body. That body is going to be a spiritual body. What's that body going to be like? I don't know, but I know that I'll be able to walk again when I get that body. I look forward to that. The day of judgment, the resurrected day, is going to be the day we will get our new resurrected bodies and it will be a house from God, eternal in the heavens. Now somebody says, well, Don, you said what's going to happen to the people in Hades. What about us? What if the Lord came? What if the trumpet sounded tonight? What's going to happen to us? The Bible answers that also. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead, that's the people in Hades, shall be raised incorruptible, and we, the people living, shall be changed. You know what that means? If the Lord come, came tonight, the trumpet will sound, and we are going to be changed. We will be transformed into that new body, and then every one of us are going to be called before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's the next step in the chart. That is the judgment. After both the good and the bad, 
have the resurrected bodies, we will all stand before the throne of Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, 32 says, All nations shall be gathered before Him. He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. And ladies and gentlemen, all of humanity is going to be there from Adam and Eve until the, the latest baby born. On that day, the rich man and Lazarus will stand before God to receive their judgment. On that day, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will stand before God to receive their judgment. On that day, Ahab, Jezebel, and Judas will stand before God. Romans 14 and verse 11 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I've had people say to me before, What is the point of the judgment anyway? If you've already been in paradise or you've already been in torment, it seems like you've already been judged. It seems like you already know where you're going to go. What is the point of the judgment? And I think that sometimes we think about this incorrectly because we think that it's going to be a day in which the Lord's going to weigh the facts and, and He's going to say, okay, well, He's been pretty good. He gets to go to heaven. Okay, no, He's, he's going to go to heaven. It's not going to be like that. It's not a day when the Lord's going to weigh the facts. He knows the moment you die where you're going to spend eternity. We would more accurately describe this day as the pronouncement of Judgment Day. It is the day in which the Lord is going to tell you why you were lost. It's the day He's going to tell you why you were saved. Now somebody says, well, Don, that still seems un uh, uh, unnecessary because the righteous and the wicked, they already know where they're going. Let me tell you something. The Judgment Day is important for several reasons. Number one, for those of us who haven't died yet, we haven't been in paradise or torment. It's good for us for that reason. Number two, listen to this. This is very important. On that day, righteousness will be displayed. Now you may say, what in the world are you talking about? On the day of judgment, Jesus Christ is going to appear before the world. Every eye shall see Him. The last time the world saw Jesus Christ, he was hanging on the cross, condemned as a criminal. Now you say, no, remember the last time he was seen of men? He was resurrected and he was seen by fire. Friends, the last time the world saw him, he was condemned to die. But on that day, he will be the righteous judge and every eye will see him and he will be vindicated. Number three, it is going to be a day of exposure. The reasons why a man is lost will be stated. The reasons why a man is saved will be heralded. Friends, I do not believe there will be a single person in hell who doesn't know why he is there. And there will likewise not be a single person in heaven who doesn't know why he is there. And so it is important for those reasons. The judgment day is so very important. Next, when we get to eternity, after the judgment, Matthew 25, 46, the Lord will say, to these, he says, to both to the wicked and the righteous, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I want you to notice that the wicked and the righteous are going to two different places. One is everlasting, the other is eternal. Those two words in the Greek are exactly the same word. You know what that means? The length of hell and the length of heaven are the same. The length of time that hell will exist. I hear brethren sometimes today saying, hell is a place where you just go and you burn up and that's going to be the end. That is a false doctrine. The length of hell and the length of heaven are the same. If you go to hell eternally, you will be there and you will burn forever and ever and ever. Man has been created in the image of God. He gave us a soul that will exist somewhere forever. Now, I want you to notice on this chart, there are two alternatives for where you will spend eternity. The one at the top is a place of eternal bliss. It is heaven. The Bible says on that day, the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 46 calls it life eternal. If you look at the bottom, we've got hell. You see the fire. You see the brimstone. This is the place Revelation 21.8 describes as the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's the place the Lord has in mind in Matthew 25 when He describes everlasting punishment. How long is it going to last? Revelation 14 and verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night. Friends, 
I cannot think of anything more terrifying than that, and I mean that. If a man dies and he goes to hell, he has tomorrow and the next day and the next hundred years, the next thousand years, the next million years to suffer, and he will be no closer to the end. Each day that passes, he is no closer to the end. That is the type of thing that makes my, my, my soul shudder. It is the type of thing that makes me think I will do anything I have to do to get my life right with the Lord because I don't want to wake up and lift up my eyes and find myself in a situation like this. I mentioned to those who were here on Sunday that on May the 6th of this year, I flipped a four-wheeler through the air four times. I hit the ground. I broke my back. The next time I lifted up my eyes that I'm aware of was several days later in a hospital, and I never know what hit me. I have no memory of it to this day. I nearly died. What if I had? What if I had lifted up my eyes in eternity at that moment? What I want to tell you tonight is the only thing that would have mattered is how I was living one second before I flipped that four-wheeler. You could leave here tonight and have an experience like that. I'm telling you, I didn't see it coming. You could leave here tonight and have an experience like that, and the only thing that will matter is how were you living right before that. I'm going to tell you a true story, and I'm going to offer the invitation. About five years ago, I was preaching for the church in Charleston, South Carolina, right before I moved to the Memphis area to work with GBM. We had a couple in the congregation, man and his wife. They'd been unfaithful for months. On a particular Sunday night... The man showed up alone. I preached, and he sat out, and he had a, we had a foyer like this, and he sat out in the foyers. And when I walked out, I saw him with his face in his hand. He seemed distraught, and I thought, he's going to get his life right. He is it's eating at him. I shook hands, and we talked. He left. He didn't get his life right. The next morning, he went to work, maybe the day after, Monday or Tuesday, he went to work. I don't know what happened. It was raining that day. He was on a motorcycle. Some people say that maybe a, a car hit the rear wheel of his motorcycle and he lost control and his head just smashed the pavement. He wasn't wearing a helmet. They sent a helicopter to medevac him to the hospital. They called the elders. They called his wife, his family. His wife got there to the hospital and he's laying there unresponsive. She said, can he hear me? The doctor said, you know, we don't know. She knew they'd been unfaithful. She didn't know what to do. She said to her husband, she grabbed his hand, and she said, I'm going to say a prayer right now. And she said, if you can hear me and if you agree, I want you to squeeze my hand. And she prayed, Lord, please forgive him of his sins and make him right and ready to go to heaven. Amen. And she said, I think he squeezed my hand. You know why she did that? She didn't know what else to do. She was that desperate. Brethren, he was in his 40s when that happened, close to the age that I am right now. Why am I telling that story? As a Christian, maybe his life was right, and maybe he could fix things, and I hope to see that brother in heaven one day. But here's what I'm telling you. Every one of us is in a situation where we don't know what is going to happen to us and where we will spend eternity. We're asking the question tonight, where do we go when we die? And the answer to that question is, it depends on where you are when you're living. The Lord has put a soul in each of us. For 70 or 80 or 90 years, however long you live, that soul dwells in the body. And I worship God with the soul, or I don't. I love God with the soul, or I don't. But the day will come when you will pass from this life, maybe very abruptly, maybe unexpectedly. And where you go when you die is going to depend on where you were when you were living. If you pull out of here tonight and a car strikes your vehicle, don't say it's not going to happen. If a car strikes your vehicle and you open your eyes in eternity, will you lift up your eyes in torment and think, I just heard a sermon about that. Or will you open your eyes to see angels? Tonight, that decision is yours. If you're not a New Testament Christian, you're not going to like the answer. But you can fix that tonight. You can obey the gospel. The Bible teaches...
to be a child of God, to have your sins forgiven, you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you're ready to do that, we're ready to assist you and baptize you tonight. If you're here tonight and you say, I don't understand, please have a study with me, we'll do that tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been right. I'm afraid what would happen to me if I lifted up my eyes in eternity. Don't leave here. Don't put your head on your pillow tonight in that situation. Make your life right. If it's public and you need to fix it publicly, do that tonight. We would be honored to go to God and to pray for you. This evening, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come as together we stand and sing the invitation song. All things are ready. Oh.